And what I'm going to be talking about is the health problems of grazing animals. And these are the specific conditions or diseases that I'm going to talk about. It's not all inclusive, but it, um, when I think of pasture and I think of, the, of what issues I might encounter with livestock on pasture, these are the ones that, that come to mind. Um, I'll try to identify the pictures as we go through. This is a picture of um, one of the goats at our research center. We used to graze chicory. We grew it for a number of years. I'd kind of like to put it back into our pasture mix. Both goats and sheep do real well on it. There's some evidence to suggest that it may help with internal parasites. In fact, there's a lot of interest around the world, I think, in kind of moving a little bit away from our traditional grass legume pastures and maybe looking at some things like herbs and forbs and that sort of thing for small ruminants. So I'm going to look at these disease conditions as they're written, kind of in alphabetical order. The first thing I want to talk about is, is bloat. Some of these disease conditions I'm going to talk about are not specific to pasture or it's not like they can occur in, in, in another production system, but they're predominantly associated with animals that are grazing. Bloat is simply an overextension of the rumen or reticulum. Gas is trapped, and the animal is unable to belch. This picture you see here is fairly typical of what I see in some of my sheep in the spring when they first go out to graze that lush, wet spring pasture. They'll get a, kind of a mild case of bloat. And as you can see, the, it's on the left-hand side where the rumen is. Bloat is probably more common in cattle than sheep and goats, but it can certainly occur in goats and especially sheep. And of course, it can be a life-threatening condition. The, the particular you in, in this slide, it was certainly not a life-threatening condition, but it most definitely can be. In fact, sometimes the only symptom you have is a dead animal. The signs are, uh, clinical signs are what I've already talked about, that distended abdomen on the left side. They may stand in unusual postures or lay down in, in an unusual way. They may show uh, signs of pain. Teeth grinding is a common sign of pain, uh, restlessness, uh, frequent urination and defecation. They're uncomfortable. And of course, sudden death. Death if we don't treat them properly or successfully, but sometimes we just find them dead. But one thing I want to caution you about is Bloat can also be a normal post-mortem change. You find an animal out there in the field, and let's say it died of, of worms, it is still going to look bloated. So you have to be careful about assuming you know, any animal that looks bloated is bloated, because it's somewhat a normal change after they die. There's two primary types of bloat what we call primary nutritional or frothy bloat, and there's two kinds of those. And then the second one, what we call secondary or free gas bloat. With the frothy bloat, there's an entrapment of the normal gases of fermentation, and it's, a, and it's in a stable foam condition. It's got the um, contents of digestion is, is mixed in. Within frothy bloat, we can get it on pasture, and we can get it on feedlot in a feedlot situation. Primarily when we think of bloat, we are thinking of, of pasture bloat. It's most commonly associated with animals that are grazing legume or legume-dominated pastures, such as those containing alfalfa, ladino, red and white clovers. It can also be seen in animals grazing young green cereal crops, rape, kale, turnips, and vegetable crops. And as I mentioned, it, it can also occur just on straight grass pastures, very wet pastures, very succulent pastures in the spring. As I mentioned, it can occur under feedlot conditions. And it's usually because those animals are consuming a high carbohydrate diet, or the other thing that's associated with feedlot bloat is when the grains are very finely ground. It's usually not a good idea to grind grains, especially fine. And, and I'm going to say particularly for sheep and goats. Sheep and goats are almost always better off being fed whole grains. The only time they can't consume whole grains is, is before their rumen develops. So when you start creep feeding, say, at a week of age, those need to be um, ground or cracked. But if you put lambs or goats into a feedlot, you're best off feeding 
feeding coarser whole grains. It, it prevents a lot of potential disease problems. But the traditional bloat is what we associate with pasture, and we can get it in a, a variety of different plants, but it's most common in, in legumes. A lot of people will claim, well, you can't graze alfalfa because you'll get a lot of bloat. It's certainly a risk, but doesn't mean you can't, you can't successfully graze it. The secondary or free gas bloat, there's no foam associated with it, but they can't expel the gas. They can't burp, they can't belch. Usually there's something that's restricting the movement of the gas within their system. It could be an obstruction in their esophagus. We can also get bloat under some other circumstances. Um, again, it's this secondary bloat without the, the froth. If, they're, if they are down, if you've ever heard the term cast, a cast sheep is a sheep that gets kind of gets stuck on its back. It can bloat because of its position and being in that position for an extended period of time. And that's probably when a sheep gets stuck on its back, that's probably what kills it is bloat. So if you get to it quick enough, usually you can, you can save them. But if they're there for a long period of time, it doesn't really happen in goats. It, it happens more in sheep in the sense uh, you know, they're kind of square or rounder. They have wool. A lot of them are short and stocky. and also has a lot to do with the terrain. Bloat can also develop with hypocalcemia or milk fever. It can be a, 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 a symptom of that as well. So we've got some different kind of bloats. The ones we worry about primarily on pasture, again, is the pasture bloat associated with grazing those wet, succulent, you know, high-quality pastures. So how do we treat bloat? Well, how we treat it's going to depend on how severe it is. In some cases, in that free gas bloat, it could be as simple as, as removing that blockage getting that animal to belch or passing a tube into the stomach. It's not going to do you any good to pass a tube into the stomach if they've got frothy bloat, because you have to deal with that, that froth or that foam. And so the typical treatment is to drench with some sort of anti-foaming agent. This would include vegetable or cooking oils, uh, mineral oils, paloxylene, which is an um, anti-foaming agent. It's a commercial one. It's sold under the trade name TheraBloat. And then there's cymethicone preparations. And these are typically your antacids. For example, Mylanta or Gas X. My typical treatment for a mild case of bloat is just to use, to drench them with Mylanta. And it usually does the trick. Because when I see bloat in my sheep, or we occasionally see it in the, um, in the goats at the research center, we will treat it with an anti-foaming agent, uh, Mylanta, or even the baking soda something to, to relieve the gas. In extreme circumstances where the animal's kind of about ready to die, the rumen can be punctured to relieve the gas. This should be done as a last resort. I've got the initials VX in there in the sense that it should be done by a veterinarian. Of course, the very nature of it being life-threatening may make it hard to get a veterinarian in time, but they're even if you successfully relieve the gas, there can be uh, an issue with the wound. So you really only want to do this as a last resort. It's usually done with a trocar or even a syringe, a, a, a large gauge syringe. Somebody asked a question about how, how much by Lanta. When we use a lot of different human medicines, and there's a lot of them we can use for digestive problems, I kind of think of a sheep as an adult human and, and kind of give them about the same amount, although I'll be the first one to admit that it's uh, trial and error uh, on it, you know, because there aren't going to be any dosages and that sort of thing on these medicines that we use. And I use, as Jeff mentioned, I just use the same syringe that I would use to deworm with, uh, a syringe with a long metal nozzle on it. I don't, I don't let them drink it. I, I drench them and I force it down. You can also use a pass an anti-foaming agent with a stomach tube. You could put it directly into the tube. I've always been successful just using a, um, a syringe, a drenching syringe. Uh, but I have to admit, I've when I've seen bloat in our goats at the research center and my own sheep at home, I've never seen what I would consider instantaneously life-threatening, where they've been where they you know really needed again to relieve gas by puncturing the rumen. Like 
all diseases, we'd much rather prevent it than have to treat it. And how do we do that? Well, I'm going to keep repeating what Jeff said, I think, in the first webinar. Dilution is the solution. We can reduce the amount of legume in the pasture. A common mix is about 30% legume, about 70% grass. We could use legumes that are non-bloat forming. Bird's foot trefoil, crown vetch, and cerise lespedes are all examples of high quality legume forages that don't cause bloat. In the case of bird's foot trefoil and cerise lespedes, I don't know about the vetch. The reason they, that they don't cause bloat is because they contain condensed tannins. And these condensed tannins also have an inhibitory effect on internal parasites. Uh, cerise lespedes in particular has been shown to have an inhibitory effect on parasites. It doesn't affect the parasites in the animal, but when it's consumed, it affects the ability of the eggs to hatch and the larva to develop into an infective stage. So a couple of positives with these um, high tannin containing forages is in addition to parasites, they also have uh, not put the animals at risk for bloat. When you have at risk pastures that, that have a lot of legumes or fresh, you know, again, succulent spring wet pastures, give them gradual access. You know, just don't turn a bunch of hungry animals out to these pastures. Ideally, delay grazing until after the dew has lifted. You can fill them up, feed them dry hay before letting them out to graze. Because again, the last thing you want to do is, is put hungry animals, hungry, thirsty animals out on fresh, lush, high moisture vegetative forage. You can feed anti-foaming agents. You can feed the paloxylene. You have to, they have to be fed continuous. Ionophores, such as Bovatec and Rumensin, also have a um, help prevent bloat. In fact, you know, an advantage, there are very, I can't really think of any disadvantages of ionophores, Bovatec and Rumensin. They have uh, so many positive effects on the rumen and so many positive potential effects on health. When you're turning animals out for the first time in the year or turning them out to these pastures for the first time, keep an eye on the animals. Keep, keep an eye. See if there's any signs of blow. See if there's any animals that need treated. Okay, the next problem I want, potential problem I want to talk about is the alkaloids, fescue toxicosis. You know from our previous webinars that tall Fescue is the primary cool season perennial grass in the eastern United States. Uh, so many of our pastures are dominant fescue. Kentucky 31 tall fescue contains an endophyte, essentially a fungus, that produces ergot alkaloids, which are essentially a toxin. So you have, uh, and this fungus and this toxin protect the plant. These, this is a very hardy forage tolerates you know, drought better, tolerates grazing better, tolerates disease better. But that's not necessarily beneficial for the animal. These alkaloids affect many different systems in the body, primarily systems that are controlled by neurotransmitters or brain chemicals. They affect the heart, the blood, the appetite, hormones, the gut motility, muscle contractions, and body temperature. So they can affect a lot of different parts of the animal. The signs of fescue toxicosis vary by livestock species. You've heard a lot about horses. You've heard a lot about beef cattle. Sheep seem to be less affected than cattle. We have fairly limited information on goats. And we certainly don't know the cost of fescue toxicosis to the small ruminant industry. But just as way of comparison, Fescue toxicity costs the beef industry $500 million to $1 billion per year. Now, obviously, this is a much larger industry, but this is a huge cost. So it is costing our industry. You know, exactly how much, we don't exactly know. Because the, the toxin can affect many different parts of the 
systems in the animal, there's a lot of different things that potentially can happen. It, it's more like a syndrome. And in a syndrome, it's usually they're not clinically sick. You can't pinpoint, oh, this animal's got fescue toxicity. It's mostly subclinical. It's mostly things you can't see. Maybe sometimes you can't even prove. We've got some research data on sheep and a little bit on goats. So here's some of the effects that fescue, the toxin, can have on small ruminants. Some of these have been scientifically proven. There's various studies that have been published. Some of them are anecdotal. People think they're happening. And again, they're subclinical. So a syndrome doesn't have one symptom. It's not A plus B equals C. It's many different things. I've kind of categorized the symptoms into three areas, health and welfare, growth, and reproduction. In terms of health and welfare, the fescue foot is commonly associated with cattle. Fat necrosis has been identified in goats, and it's kind of like there's a big mount, there's a big growth of fat inside the rumen, and it affects gut motility. Rough hair coats, uh, heat stress, higher body temperatures has been um, has been quantified really in all ruminant livestock. In terms of growth, they're going to have a suppressed appetite. They're not going to want to eat as much. There was a study published at uh, Tennessee. Uh, State University that where they fed seeds that were infected and not infected and the does ate considerably less of the seeds that were infected. I see in the uh, chat box that I have the wrong word up there. In my entire life I've never been able to figure out the difference between antidotal and antidotal. I always get them mixed up but hopefully you know what I meant. So they intake less feed. And again, this has been documented in, in sheep and goats. Most importantly, from a standpoint of productivity, you're going to get reduced weight gain. And again, this has been documented, documented in both sheep and goats. In fact, the, the original research that was done with uh, Kentucky 31 infect, endified infected fescue and Max-Q fescue, which was a novel variety that had the endophyte but didn't have the same effects. That initial research was done with lambs. And lambs have a better, significantly better rate of gain when they were grazing Max-Q. When they took the endophyte out, the plants didn't persist. The animals did fine, but the plants didn't persist. So the, the novel varieties, and Jeff can probably explain them a, a whole lot better than I can, but the initial research was done with lambs. And so lambs will gain better, kids will gain better when they are grazing non-infected or novel variety of fescue. Reproduction is, I think, the area that we know less about, although there has been a couple of uh, published studies with sheep. I just recently put a study on uh, my blog at Clemson University, they did a study looking at the effect of, of fescue toxicity on fetal growth. Usually when they do research, they tend to feed the seeds. That's their way of um, kind of simulating the grazing situation. So they'll feed with infected seeds and non-infected seeds. And what they found was the lambs, I think, had 37% lower birth weight. They didn't have as much muscle development. And the, and the reason is because the toxin affects blood flow to the fetus. Down in Arkansas at the USDA ARS station, uh, they've done work with both sheep and cattle. The toxin uh, has an inhibitory effect on prolactin, which can cause poor mothering ability, reduced milk production, and sometimes no milk at all. So there are some documented effects of fescue uh, toxicity. Uh, in small ruminants. We know there's a lot of issues with reproduction in horses. It's hard to document these reproductive uh, effects. The growth ones aren't, aren't so hard, but the reproductive ones are harder. But the potential for affecting reproduction is, is definitely there. And hopefully, more research will be done uh, to determine the effect of uh, the toxin on small ruminants, on their productivity, when the expo when can they be 
when can they consume it and not have a problem and, and when is the risk periods and that's hopefully what we'll learn more in years to come. So how do we minimize these potential effects of fescue toxicosis? Again, dilution is the solution. If we dilute the endified infected tall fescue with other grasses or legumes. If we replace the endophyte tall fescue with another forage, um, either the endophyte free, which as I mentioned, that pro it has a problem with uh, plant persistence, or the novel tall fescue varieties, the Max-Q. Max-Q is the variety we have planted at the research center, and that's also the variety that I have planted on my farm. Most of the fungus congregates near the seed head, so trying to prevent the plants from going to seed by increasing your stocking rates is a strategy. Not grazing it in the summer or fertilizing it with nitrogen uh, is a strategy. Jeff talked about stockpiling fescue for fall and winter grazing. The, effect, the endophyte's still there, but the effects of the endophyte are less when it's grazed in the fall and winter. Summer is the biggest problem. Another way to dilute it is to um, provide supplemental feed, whether that's uh, uh, hay or roughage feed or grain. You're diluting the amount of endophyte that they're consuming. Uh, at the research center in Arkansas, the researcher recommends not to breed on endophyte infected uh, pastures because we have some documented effects of it but there's just a lot of concern that it, that it affects reproduction. So don't breed on these pastures. And the last one, feeding mineral mixes that are specifically formulated for sheep and goats, or goats, it's kind of the idea of keeping the animals from a nutritional standpoint, keeping them uh, you know, in a, a healthy, so if there are some mineral issues, um, you know, having them, they won't be deficient in minerals, they'll have what they need. That's kind of the rationale for that. And I put or because if you have sheep, you need to feed sheep mineral. If you have goats, you need to feed goat mineral. You don't feed a livestock mineral and you don't feed uh, sheep mineral to goats. They have different needs and need to be fed different minerals. Okay, the next um, health issue is gastrointestinal parasites by far the number one problem affecting small ruminants that graze. There is many different types of internal parasites can that affect small ruminants, but there's two primary ones. And I don't know that there's anyone from a part of the country that this isn't probably true. Uh, the primary uh, parasite is the barber pole worm, Homonchus contortus. It's a roundworm. It's a nematode. Uh, it affects the... Uh, Abomasum, it pierces the lining of the abomasum, it sucks blood, it causes anemia. Uh, the two primary symptoms are the ones you see pictured here. On the left you can see the goat that's uh, got a very pale eyelid, a Famacha score of five, he's very anemic. And on the right you see a goat that has bottle jaw. Coccidia is uh, not a worm per se, it's a single cell protozoa. Uh, it can be a significant problem, particularly with kids, young kids and lambs. Uh, its point of attack is the small intestines. It's microscopic. If you cut an animal open, you can see barber pole worms. They're the largest of the worms, with the exception of tapeworms. Coccidia is microscopic. You'd only be able to see the damage that's done to the small intestines. A uh, typical uh, symptom is diarrhea, but they can also get anemic uh, with coccidia. We typically associate worms, stomach worms, tapeworms with pasture. We usually associate coccidia more with a confinement situation, but with our newer um, intensive grazing systems, we can simulate the conditions of confinement on pasture and we can have coccidia problems. If animals congregate near the water source, near the shelter, under the shade, we can very easily create those same um, environmental conditions. Essentially, sheep and goats share the same parasites. The only exception is coccidia. Coccidia is species-specific. Uh, poultry coccidia doesn't affect sheep, and sheep coccidia doesn't affect goats. Llamas and alpacas, if some of you folks have those animals, they can be infected by the parasites that affect sheep and goats as well as cattle. For the most part, cattle and horses uh, have different parasites than sheep and goats. There's just a little bit of cross-infection with homonchus contortus. The risk of clinical parasitism, and what I mean by that is 
If an animal is clinically parasitized, it needs to be treated. Uh, in other cases, an animal may carry a parasite load, but that doesn't need, it requires treatment because it's normal for animals to carry some parasites. But the risk of clinical parasitism varies by species, with uh, goats being more susceptible than sheep. It varies by genetics. Some breeds have less of a problem. It varies by your production system, you know, how much confinement, how much grazing, how much supplementation what your grazing system is, what the forages you graze, all different things, and certainly climate. Parasites don't tend to be a problem when it's dry, cold and dry, or hot and dry. They need moisture. Uh, for the most part, the barber pole worm needs warmth. The coccidia will do fine where it's a little bit uh, cooler. And then within your own climate, you can have you will see differences in the risk of parasitism based on your rainfall patterns, your humidity patterns. Some years are worse than others. Farms are different. Every farm doesn't get the same rainfall, even if it's in the same county. The ability of the animal to resist parasitic infection or to tolerate parasitic infection varies by species. Again, goats being more susceptible to sheep varies by breed with the hair sheep generally being more resistant than the wool breeds. Uh, within the goat population, a lot less uh, work has been done on goats, but there, uh, there is some indication that the Kiko and the Spanish are more resistant to parasites than the boar and our dairy goats. Age, young animals certainly more susceptible, and genetics in an individual animal. There's what we call the 80-20 or the 70-30 rule. And what that means is only 20, 30 percent of the, of the herd or flock carries 70 to 80 percent of the infection. In other words, they're responsible for 70 to 80 percent of the eggs that are being deposited on pasture. So within your own breed or your own farm, you can select for parasite resistance and improve the genetics of your own flock, regardless of breed. You can select more resistant breeds to start with, but within your own breed population, you can select those which are more resistant. My parasites are, are, are a whole subject and a whole class. Here's my one slide that tells you how to control parasites. And controlling parasites isn't simple. There's no recipe. There's no one thing that will control them. I call it integrated parasite management, or, or IPM. Uh, you might look at it as a holistic parasite management. It needs to be a combination of management. So all those items lifted, listed on the left-hand side, resting pastures, rotating pastures, grazing clean pastures, mowing pastures, taking off a hay crop, grazing different species, grazing alternative forages, uh, which would include browse for goats, uh, maintaining a minimum grazing height. The first two inches of the pasture contain 80% of the worm larva, so you don't want animals to graze below two or three inches. Zero grazing, which is just uh, the fancy term for removing them from pasture. Uh, that may, might be the case for a, for a difficult year or a difficult group of animals. Nutritional supplementation, animals in better nutritional status have less problems with parasites, protein supplementation in particular, since the barber pole worm is a bloodsucker. Natural products. There are no, quote, natural dewormers. A dewormer kills parasites. We really don't have any natural product with the exception of copper that do that. But that doesn't mean you can't try using whatever you want. Maybe they don't kill parasites, but maybe they reduce the number of animals that require deworming. And as I already alluded to, genetic selection select a more resistant species, select a more resistant breed, select a more resistant animals within your flock or herd. We want to do all these things on the management side so that we, have, we don't have to deworm a lot of animals. In the old days, we just dewormed, kind of like we were vaccinating, and we didn't worry as much about management. But now we need to try to solve the parasite problem as much with management as we can, understanding that some animals or some animals within a group may still require treatment. So that's when we need to use the pharmaceutical approach or the dewormers. Targeted selected treatment means treating an animal 
re that requires it when it requires it. We're only treating an animal that would benefit from treatment. It requires that we frequently monitor our livestock. In the middle of summer where parasites are most active, I'm going to say every two weeks. Farther south, probably more often than that. Farther north, maybe not quite as often. Problem is the worst in the middle of the summer. It's more of a problem for a longer period of time as we move from the south to the north. But it can be a significant problem in any of our climates in the United States. For matcha scoring, many of you may be familiar with that. It's when we use the card and we determine the level of anemia and whether or not we're going to deworm that animal. For matcha card only works for blood feeding parasites such as barber pole worm. That is our primary parasite, but there could be a situation where you have other parasites as well. So they develop what's called a five-point check. You check five parts on the animal's body. The eye, which is the FEMACHA score. The back, for body condition. The rear, to see if they have any evidence of scouring or diarrhea. The jaw, to see if they have bottle jaw. And the nose, to see if they have a nasal discharge. For goats, we replace the nose with the coat. We look at coat condition as an indication of health. So we use those criteria. And say the animal has coccidiosis. Well, he may have a poor body condition score, and he may have a really dirty, messy butt. And so that might be, hey, he needs treated. So I can look at all of those things to kind of look at a complete parasite control program, understanding that the barber pole worm and the anemia are the primary things I'm going to look at. The other thing is to keep in mind who's most at risk. Obviously, young lambs and kids are most at risk for parasites. But the other class of animals you need to be concerned about is those that are going to lamb or kid. It's called the peripartrate period. That's the time before kidding and lambing and the time after. At this time, the female suffers a temporary loss of immunity to parasites. Her egg counts go way up. This is particularly significant if you're lambing or kidding in the spring because it coincides with the time that the parasites are resuming their life cycle due to weather conditions. I put in there treatment or management. Treatment is to deworm her during that peripartial period. Management is to find an alternative method to deal with that risk. One way is to increase the protein content of the late gestation ration. Another method is to keep them off pasture during the peripartial period. When you do have to deworm, and again, the whole goal is to deworm as few animals as you have to, but when you do it, you want to make darn certain you use the anthelmintics properly. Properly means using only drench formulations. Properly means giving all medications orally. Properly means dosing the animal on an accurate weight. Those kinds of things. Using a, uh, the syringe with the long metal nozzle so that you can deposit the drug over the tongue. Proper use of anthelmintics also means periodic testing for anthelmintic resistance. The worms have developed resistance to all the dewormers and all dewormer classes. And the only way you know if a dewormer works on your farm is to test for resistance. Two ways to test, before and after fecal egg counts, or a drench right test. Now, I know in that one slide I've thrown a whole lot of stuff out there, and I am going to try to answer a few of those questions before I go on. First question was about copper. A lot of research has been gone into using copper oxide wire particles to deworm sheep and goats. They're a less absorbable form of copper as compared to copper sulfate. They're contained in a product called Copershore, which is a bolus for cattle. You actually open that bolus up, and they're little wire rods, and you repackage them into smaller doses for sheep and goats. Typical is a half a gram for a lamb or kid and a gram for a doe or a ewe. Goats were not too concerned about the copper issue. Sheep, I would want to know the copper status before I give anybody copper. And I would certainly only give the copper oxide wire particles to animals that have FEMACHA scores of, of 4 or 5. Uh, if a goat or sheep was in a feedlot, how long would it take to lose its worms? Over time, its fecal egg count will keep going down. It's going to be variable. But I can tell you, when we did our pen versus pasture study, when those goats were in there for 100 days, they didn't all reduce to zero egg counts. On the other hand, not any of them ever needed dewormed. Not any of them ever had a 
or Fumacha score, but their actual A counts never went to zero. Sometimes they did, but it, it takes some time. Let's see. As far as that paripartrant treatment, ideally it's done a couple of weeks before lambing or kidding. Sometimes people do it at the time of lambing and kidding because they have the animals in the pen and it's easier to do. In the very minimum, do it the first couple of weeks after. Because remember that paripartrant period occurs before lambing and kidding, up to several weeks before, up to many weeks after. So it makes sense that you would do it before. And like I said, out of convenience, some people do it at the time of lamb and kidding, it's important to use a dewormer that's effective against the hypobiotic dewormers. What about injectable ivermectin? Injectable ivermectin is illegal because it cannot meet the extra label requirement for drug use. Injectables promote anthelmintic resistance because they leave a residual. You want to use the oral formulation of ivermectin because if it is effective, it is more effective than the injectable. Ivermectin, Balbazin, and Safeguard tend to be the dewormers with the highest degree of resistance, although again this could depend on your own particular farm. Yes, anthelmintics are dewormers. We have a bad habit sometimes in academia using the less friendly words, but a dewormer is an anthelmintic. I hope I got all of those questions uh, that were asked about parasites. Again, I realize on one slide it's an entire course and it's a lot of stuff that I'm throwing at you. But it is the most significant health problem on pasture. The next health problem I want to talk about is grass tetany, or grass staggers, which is hypomagnesium. It's a low blood magnesium. In all my years of raising small ruminants, I have never encountered this. But it certainly could be a risk. It's caused by a low level of magnesium in growing forages and an inner an interference of the absorption of that magnesium due to various factors. It's much more commonly associated with cattle. But in small ruminants, particularly sheep, it would be most common in nursing females during early lactation, especially during late winter, early spring, which is the period we're entering now. It causes various symptoms, hyperexcitability, muscle spasms, convulsions, collapse, death. Really not that different than when you think of milk fever, which is hypocalcemia. Uh, it's usually, the diagnosis usually confirmed by a response to treatment. Uh, the Copashore boluses are readily available at most animal health supply stores. So the treatment for grass tetany would be combined solutions of calcium and magnesium via an IV. Prevention, and this is common with cattle, is magnesium supplement or supplemental feeding of hay or grain which would have more magnesium than the fresh forage that they're grazing. Again, not something I, I have really ever seen in sheep and goats. The next slides, it's going to sound like I'm really focusing on these because I got a lot of words in these slides, but it's only because it's probably harder to explain these, this particular illnesses or diseases than some of the other ones. And that's looking at nitrate and prussic acid poisoning. Normally, uh, in the ruminant, nitrate is converted to ammonia and then bacterial protein, and there's very little buildup in the plant. But if they consume higher amounts of nitrate because they've accumulated in the plant, the nitrates are converted to nitrites. The nitrite is absorbed in the bloodstream and converts hemoglobin, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but methemoglobin, which is unable to transport oxygen. The animal is going to die from the nitrate or nitrite poisoning due to lack of oxygen. Sexually, it's going to suffocate. Sheep tend to have a higher tolerance to nitrates because they have a greater ability to convert the methemoglobin back to hemoglobin. And then keep in mind that besides the plants that they're consuming, water could also be high in nitrates, particularly due to, due to runoff. Uh, prussic acid or cyanide poisoning, uh, here we're basically talking about uh, plants in the sorghum family contain a secondary compound, uh, compound that gets converted to prussic acid, which is toxic in wilting forages. So we're talking about environmental conditions that are causing wilting. Where the nitrates are, com are, are concentrated more in the stems, the leaves, uh, prussic acid is concentrated more in the leaves. Very similar symptoms and cause of death is it interferes with the ability of the blood carrying oxygen, causing animals to die from suffocation. I found this uh, little piece on the internet and I thought it was kind of interesting. 
uh, nitrate poisoning in livestock was first reported over 100 years ago. And it was because of the, if you remember, the range wars. They deliberately salted the range with potassium nitrite to get rid of what they call range maggots, to kill the sheep, to get them off of the cattle ranges. So that's kind of when it, one of the first places it was documented, back during the range wars and those mean, mean, mean cattlemen. Nitrates and prussic acid, the risk tends to be on certain plants. Some plants are more likely to accumulate nitrates than others. Mostly annual forage crops, corn, small grains, Sudan grass, sorghum, some of our weeds like pigweed and lamb's quarter, and some vegetables. They're more likely to, um, to accumulate nitrates. On the prussic acid or cyanide side, we're talking about sorghum type plants. So forage sorghum, which we have planted at our goat test, sorghum Sudan grass, Sudan grass, and Johnson grass. So warm season annual grasses. We can also have cyanide poisoning or prussic acid poisoning in some of the uh, some other types of plants. It is one of the major types of uh, poisoning that we we can see in sheep and goats, wild cherry being an example. So to risk the reduce the risk of nitrate poisoning, we're kind of uh, you know trying to address the situation that causes the nitrates to accumulate in those plants. So one is delay harvest or grazing. After a drought, you've had a long drought and it finally rains, well, don't just automatically go out there and graze. Split nitrogen applications, raise cutting of grazing height. We can test forages for nitrates. Of course, we can also have nitrates in, in, in our grains as well. Uh, harvesting the forages silage, they're more stable in uh, hay. Avoid feeding high nitrate forage to susceptible animals. Limit their intake. Uh, the bottom three are just the idea of it's just kind of the basic concept that healthier animals, animals on a higher plane of nutrition, can handle potential risks better. They can be conditioned to eat a certain degree when they're healthy, when they consume adequate carbohydrates, uh, you know, carbohydrates meaning enough energy in their diet. Uh, this is a picture from a couple years ago when we were grazing some forage sorghum. We've never really run into the conditions in our buck test. Where, where nitrates or prussic acid would be a potential problem. In terms of the prussic acid, again, this is the, the forage sorghum that was planted, is to avoid grazing young plants and new growth, drought stress plants, frosted plants, properly curing the hay, using tester animals. Whenever you have a question about forage, don't put your best animals out there and don't feed them all they can eat. And again, the prussic acid and the nitrates took a few slides to explain but I don't actually consider them to be you know, the, our biggest risk, but they're certainly a potential risk as you move into to grazing some annuals. And Jeff talked a lot about annuals in, when, in, during his presentations, and they're also one of the ways to fill in some of those forage gaps during the year. Phytoestrogens. Um, some pasture legumes contain chemicals called phytoestrogens, which can affect the reproductive system. They have a chemical chemical structure structure to estrogen. The content is high in legumes, including alfalfa, soybeans, and clovers, especially red, white, and es but especially subterranean. They can cause fertility problems in female ruminants, especially sheep, infertility, usually a lot of delayed estrus, low lambing rates, uterine prolapse, and dystocia. Most of the work that's been done with uh, phytoestrogens and their effect on reproduction in sheep and cattle. A lot of it's been done in Australia. Most of it's been done with subterranean clover, which most of us don't plant. I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago about uh, improving lambing and kidding rates, and I talked about phytoestrogens being a potential risk when you breed. They are a potential risk, but they shouldn't be overblown. Because again, most of the work's in Australia, most of it's with subterranean clover. And there's so many advantages to including red clover in pastures that it probably outweighs the risk of, their, of the amount of phytoestrogen that they contain. However, to be on the safe side is, is you cannot breed on pastures that contain too much red or subterranean clover. When you say, how much is too much? Well, that seems to vary in the literature. One example said as little as 25% was problematic because sheep selectively graze clovers over grass. 
So I don't exactly know what too much is, but mostly I just want people to be aware. There's a tremendous amount of an an anecdotal information of people breeding on uh, clover alfalfa pastures and having incredibly high lambing kidding rates. So it's kind of one of those things you, you, you consider and you kind of put on the shelf and, and don't forget, but um, it's probably not likely to be a huge problem. Poisonous plants, just want to talk about plants and poisonous plants in general. There are many, many plants that can be poisonous to sheep, goats, and other livestock. Google poisonous plants and sheep and goats and you'll be amazed how many different um, you know, how many different plants can potentially be toxic. Because really when you think about it, almost anything can be toxic if, if you were to eat enough of it. So toxicity is affected by many different factors. Of course, the plant, the part of the plant. You know, take wild cherry. It, it's, it's the leaves and it's wilted leaves. The stage of growth, the environmental conditions, the time of the year, the amount consumed, and the type of livestock. Sheep and goats are frequently used to control plants that are toxic to cattle. So they're, they're there can be differences within species and, and just so many different factors, which, which makes it extra challenging. Toxic plants tend to fall into three categories. They tend to cause sudden death, photosensitization, photosensi and neural symptoms. Just kind of, those are most of the categories they fall in. They can be the cause of unexplained deaths. You know, so it's hard to know to what extent they cause deaths. Most of the time they, they go undiagnosed. Uh, this is one of my sheep from a few years ago. Just found her dead and, you know, never knew why. Could it have been a, a, a toxic plant issue? I don't know. I'll, I'll never know what, what she died of. And, and uh, I don't know an awful lot of people that have ever had plant toxins diagnosed at a uh, diagnostic lab. But they certainly are, could be a potential cause of death. And, and when we have livestock dying for, for unknown reasons that are on pasture, that's certainly one of the things we want to look at. So how are you going to prevent and control problems with poisonous plants? Well, you could learn to identify poisonous plants in your area. You know, there's a lot of websites and books that can help you with identification. Uh, your local county extension agent or NRCS representative may be able to help you. So look for poisonous plants in your fields prior to grazing. Kind of just like preventing bloat, you know, don't turn hungry and thirsty animals out to areas where you know there's a risk. Providing water daily, providing mineral supplementation or salt supplementation year-round. Certainly you can make attempts to control not only poisonous plants, but undesirable weeds. Usually in small areas, herbicides can be useful, but plowing, digging, and mowing before the seeds mature is, is another option. I think this was, uh, this was in one of our goat pastures, uh, some nightshade, and I think some, we did some selective spraying of that. Normally, if there's enough to eat, livestock will not usually eat toxic plants. I think the greatest risk is for young animals who who experiment, but for the most part, you know, if they've got plenty to eat and plenty to choose from, they're not going to eat toxic plants. But when we get into drought drought situations or overgrazing situations, I think we increase the probability that they might consume toxic plants. I think this is the last health problem I'm going to talk about, and you may not think about it as a health problem, and that's predation. But it certainly a, a, can be a potential risk when animals, especially around pasture, it counts for significant losses in the U.S. Uh, small ruminant industry. The last time USDA APHIS tabulated the losses, it was about 37% of total losses. So for every 100 lambs or sheep or goats lost, 37 of them were due to predators. Sheep and goats have so many potential predators, coyotes, dogs, foxes, wolves, mountain lions, bobcats, bears, and a lot of birds of prey, eagles, vultures, owls, and ravens. According to that same study done in 2004, the majority of losses are coyotes and dogs. There are certainly situations in this country where, where some of these other predators are major problems, but on average, coyotes and dogs count for the largest percent. And the risk that you may have depends on your farm or ranch. It depends on your geographic area. But one of the things I want to emphasize, just like having a predator or a parasite control program in place, you should have a predator management plan in place. You won't want to wait for losses. You want to make sure 
prevent any potential losses. Because you may think that you're in a situation, well, yeah, there's no coyotes around here, there's no this or that, but the neighbor's dog could come in. So you just want to make sure, uh, or a predator flies in, you want to make sure you have it covered. Uh, there's lots of different ways to control or manage predators. It's um, much like parasites. There is not a single uh, method to uh, control or manage predators. Uh, essentially, I divide the methods into lethal and non-lethal. Non-lethal, of course, doesn't kill the predator. And lethal, we're actually eliminating the predator. Fencing dogs or guardians, shed lambing. We definitely know that lambing under in a building, at least having them there during their early part of their life can reduce a lot of predation. Bringing them in at night, uh, there are some fright tactics uh, on terms of range production, having a herder, removing carry-on. I mean, if you lose animals, you know, and you leave it out, you know, you kind of deserve to have predators if you, if you don't do these simple management things. Predators tend to go for the old sick and injured animals, so you certainly don't want to put them out on pasture. The other thing I think is important is to have a good relationship with your neighbors, with animal control, DNR, and wildlife services. These are all people that you know you might encounter should you have a predator problem or even before you have a predator problem. Have a good relationship with your neighbors. If somebody moves in next door with two big Rottweilers, you know, have a chat with them. You know, um, you just it's just in your best interest to be on good relations with them. Uh, fright tactics can be light, can be sound, can be can be different things like that. The lethal methods: hunting, shooting, trapping, denning, poisoning. Sometimes lethal methods, unfortunately, are necessary, and certainly in certain um, geographic areas. But even in the eastern states, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of these things that are done. The important thing when you use any lethal method of control is you need to know the laws of your county, of your state. And you need to understand that many predators are protected species. For example, the black vulture in Maryland, you can't, you can't kill them. They're a protected species. Certainly wolves, bears, and, and um, you know, bald e or eagles, they're all protected species. So make sure you know your laws. If you're going to use a lethal method, get in touch with wildlife services or, or DNR. The last thing you want to do is get in trouble. The two primary methods of controlling predators, I'm going to say particularly in, in the east or particularly among smaller farms, is fencing and livestock guardians. To me, there's no doubt in my mind that predator control starts with a good fence. And we have some different options. Uh, in the picture is a, a multi-strand high tensile electric fence. It's six wires, uh, the same as what we have at the research station for the goats. The wires at the bottom are closer than the, than the wires at the top. They're all hot in our climate, the, the top wire is not a hot wire. In my particular fence, I have a switch on the bottom wire as well. The best fence for sheep, you know, if, if you've got uh, unlimited finances, this is probably a woven wire or box wire fence, but it's not predator proof unless we add some electrical wires to it, some offset wires. Predators don't go under, they go through or they go under. They go under or they go through, they don't go over. So keep that in mind when you, when you think about predator control. It doesn't think a very big square in a box fence for a, for a coyote to get through. Uh, electric netting, which is a temporary type of fence, actually can do a pretty good job controlling predators. I've got an X through bob wire, because generally speaking, uh, bob wire is not good for predator control or not really good for animals either. I suppose there are some ways to adapt some bob wire fences, but we don't see too many bob wire fences in this part of the country anymore. The other common and popular method of controlling predators is through the use of livestock guardians. In most cases, I think all sheep and goat farmers should have one or two. Livestock protection dogs, llamas, or donkeys, they all have pros and cons. They all fit some situations better than others, and people tend to have a personal preference for one or two of the others. I've listed some of the breeds of livestock protection dogs. Obviously, it's not just any old dog that will work. You know, don't put your German Shepherd out there. These breeds of dogs are mostly old European breeds. They've bred for centuries for this purpose. They have a very low predatory instinct, and yet they're still friendly. They tend to be large white dogs, but there are some exceptions. There's three breeds in there that have recently been imported. Uh, I would say the third, fifth, and sixth uh, 
are larger breeds of dogs that they're now doing research with to see if they're more effective against some of the large predators that our western producers are having to deal with, in particular grizzly bears and wolves. Because I suspect my great Pyrenees dogs would crawl into a corner if they saw a wolf or a grizzly bear. But that's also not a risk for my farm. So generally speaking with these guardians you need to pick the right animal, whether it's the right breed of dog or cross of dog, or whether llamas and donkeys will work for you. Uh, llamas and donkeys kind of work a little bit different than, than the than the dogs. They don't so much bond with the animals as much as they have a dislike for, for dogs. I've got a line drawn through intact males for both llamas and donkeys. It's generally recommended that you not use them. I've got a question mark against alpacas and I've got a question mark with miniature donkeys. I know they've used alpacas in Australia for predator control. Unless somebody tells me otherwise, I would think that an alpaca would require a livestock guardian. Uh, in terms of miniature donkeys, I would think that a standard donkey is what we, we need to use, but there may be people who have experiences with the miniature donkeys providing some effectiveness. Llamas and donkeys both are going to rely on, on sight, so the, all the uh, guardians are going to work a little bit differently. But I think uh, between the guardians and the fencing, this is a good start to, to predator control, but some people can have situations where they may need more than this. And, and we've got situations here in the East where people have have this stuff and they're still suffering losses. And, and when that happens, very often they need to move to the, the lethal control. They need to work with their wildlife services in, you know, to try to find a solution. And with that, I think that's my last slide for this topic. Again, I want to remind you that recordings or links to the recordings, which will